a symbolic warning of more terrorism to come. Brick Lane today, 48 hours after the latest racist bombing. The work of repairing the damage went on all day. And with a campaign of attacks now in prospect, questions are being asked about the ability of the police to respond effectively. I, I, I think the anti-terrorist squad um, are very well trained but very narrowly trained in looking at objectives. And I think they need to do some homework on far-right extremist groups. Um, they're, they're certainly up to speed with the provies and the loyalists and such other groups, but they're in new territory here. As a result of Saturday's explosion, the anti-terrorist branch is now at full strength after scaling down for the IRA ceasefire. MI5 and special branch intelligence on the far right is being reassessed. Racist extremism is now under the microscope. Websites on the internet spew out a litany of racial hatred. Many emanate from the United States and Scandinavia. This one, homegrown, makes a specific reference to the bomb in Brick Lane, congratulating those responsible. What they do is they use the internet to communicate and of course they use encryption, coded messages on the internet to speak to each other. So it is a very difficult problem for the authorities. This afternoon in the Commons, the Home Secretary insisted that the bombers would not succeed. I want to make clear that any attack on these communities is an attack on all British people yeah. and upon the whole of British society. We will not tolerate racism of this kind, still less this pernicious and abhorrent violence as well. In the East End, the police investigation continues, but the fear is there may be another attack before a breakthrough is achieved. John Silverman, BBC News. Members of the Bradford and Bingley Building Society are likely to get windfall payments of around £1,000 after they voted in favour of... ...including four who were shot by police. Nearly a quarter of a million fans had gathered outside Rotterdam's town hall to celebrate their team Feyenoord clinching the Dutch First Division title. The huge crowds appeared good-humoured at first. It was when they began to disperse that the trouble began. Some supporters who refused to move off began throwing stones and bottles at police. Pitched battles followed, with some fans using banners as a weapon. This man was brought down by plainclothes officers. More than 70 people were arrested during several hours of rioting, which spilled into surrounding streets. Officials say that at one stage, police fired warning shots into the air, but were then forced to open fire into the crowd. Four people were hit, and one man is said to be in a critical condition. Police are investigating reports that some fans may have fired back. In all, 16 people were injured in the riots, including four policemen. It took till midnight to restore order, but not before many shops had been looted and cars wrecked. Dutch football officials described the riots as too sad for words, and the government minister warned of new powers to round up suspected hooligans. For Rotterdam, it could hardly have been a worse advert, with the city hosting the Euro 2000 final here next year. John Andrew, BBC News. British Airways is blaming a mischievous prank by a passenger for a scare involving almost 400 people on a flight between San Francisco and London. A recorded message warning of an imminent emergency told those on board to prepare for a forced landing on water. In fact, there was no emergency and the airline has apologised for the distress. Three hours after leaving San Francisco, passengers on flight 286 were told to expect a forced landing at sea. The words of the announcement apparently left no room for doubt. Attention, attention. This is an emergency announcement. I repeat, this is an emergency announcement. It may shortly be necessary to make an emergency landing on water. Passengers were then told to put on life jackets, fasten seat belts and brace themselves. Most people started to look around for signs that this was either a false alarm or a drill. And then it started a second time, a second playthrough, and by which time most people thought that this was real, and we started to put on our life jackets. But it was a false alarm, triggered in a cabin crew area. BA's ruled out a mistake by crew members or a technical fault, and says a passenger must have pressed an emergency button. 
it's a very, very difficult instruction to set off because it's actually under a plastic flap. So if there was somebody who needed to do that maliciously, they would have actually had to uh, lift the flap up and then press the button. Cabin crew had to call for help from a doctor because several passengers were so distressed. British Airways says it's contacting all of the passengers on Saturday's flight to apologise for the upset. Simon Montague, BBC News. The film star Sean Connery has been trying to revive the fortunes of the Scottish National Party just over a week before electors in Scotland elect their own parliament. He told an SNP rally in Edinburgh that Scotland should be the equal of all the other nations of the world. And Sean Connery! The world's most famous Scotsman said the introduction and Sean Connery may need to be that and more if his once only appearance is to rally the SNP and help them catch up with Labour and win against the odds. First though a swipe at the media for the way some papers have written off his party and attacked him. I'm ashamed of them and I'm angry with them. No policy detail, this was a declaration of faith in Scottish independence and an attack on the SNP's opponents. When we were up here for the referendum vote, there was a spirit and a positive enthusiasm. Well, the control freaks have blown it away. They have replaced it with fear and intimidation the very same way as others have before them. The small invited audience loved that, of course, but Labour's Scottish secretary wasn't too put out. I think Mr Connor is entitled to his views and uh, he's here primarily, as I understand it, to promote his film and I wish him every success with that. But I don't think the election contest is about a celebrity headcount uh, and we will certainly continue to stick to the arguments. One, two, three. The other parties clearly see Labour and not the SNP as the party they have to beat now. People in Scotland don't want independence. They know it would be a financial disaster. But unlike Sean Connery, we can't actually opt out of it and spend our lives in tax exile. Uh, I think Sean Connery is a very good act actor. We all enjoy his performances, but he's not a politician. We all know he's SNP anyway, and I think people will be quite unmoved. The truth is, the SNP campaign has fallen apart. The fight for control of Scotland has been low-key, and that suits Labour. Now the nationalists need to win over and win back voters who prefer low taxes and who feel safer as a permanent part of the British Union. This campaign isn't over yet, but it may take more than an emotional appeal from a famous actor to turn the tide the SNP's way. John Pienaar, BBC News, Edinburgh. We're now back to our main news tonight. One of Britain's most popular television presenters, the BBC's Jill Dando, has died after being attacked outside her home in London. She was found with serious head injuries. Our reporter Clarence Mitchell is at the scene in Fulham. Clarence, are the police uncovering any clues in the street? The police investigation, Martin, is at full swing now. There are at least 30 detectives involved in this. Behind me, uh, you can see the activity outside Jill's home here in uh, Gowan Avenue in Fulham. Uh, that will continue for some time yet. The very detailed forensic examination of the scene, the post-mortem examination of her body is ongoing, uh, not too far from here, and that, we're told, will continue for some hours yet. The principal uh, aim of the police is to establish just who this man was who was seen running off. To that end, they've established an incident room at uh, Kensington Police Station. I'll briefly give you a telephone number, 0181 246 0730. If anybody with any information has anything to say the police would very much like to hear from them uh, as soon as possible. And very briefly Clarence, any more details about the search at Putney Bridge? We're told that is continuing. Again, the police are aware of reports that a man was seen acting suspiciously. Some reports suggest he actually jumped into the Thames, others that he was attempting to. The area around the bridge is now sealed off, and police, uh, in using river boats, boats on the river, are searching. Unconfirmed reports suggest they're looking in the Battersea area, perhaps for a body, but none of this is confirmed, and the police are not connecting it directly. Equally, they're not ruling it out as possibly being connected with the the awful murder of Jill Dando. Clarence, thank you very much. The murder of our friend and colleague Jill Dando dominates tonight's news. Jill was special, not only to the millions of you who watched, admired and loved her over the years, but to all of us who had the privilege and delight of working with her. The news was best when it was read by Jill. None of us could have believed it would one day be about her. Good night.
With just over a week to go until the election of the Scottish Parliament, how is Labour fighting to retain control of the country? Panorama investigates tonight, five past ten, here on BBC One. Good evening. We've got some quite noisy.